Hey everybody, Pastor Kristen here with devotions for Thursday, October 8th, and I want to spend a couple minutes talking to you today about the, the subject of how to pray for our enemies. This topic was prompted for me uh, by a couple of conversations I've encountered recently where people are questioning how and whether we're supposed to pray for someone if they have deceived us or harmed us, whose actions have caused suffering for ourselves or for others we care about, someone who's been responsible for oppression or abuse for which they have been unrepentant. In other words, a real enemy, not just someone with whom we're having an extended agreement, but a real honest-to-goodness enemy. Now, there seem to be two basic schools of thought here. One says that it's okay, and perhaps even most faithful, to pray for that person's just desserts, especially if that prayer is coming from the hearts and mouths of the, those who have been most deeply wounded by that person. Another school says that the higher moral ground is to actually pray for that person's well-being, that enemy's welfare, not, not to wish them harm, even if that also means continuing to hold them accountable for their actions. I need to acknowledge right here that my own privilege undoubtedly reforms my, informs my response to this question. But I know that there are folks in our own faith community who wrestle with this, and so I felt compelled to offer my perspective. And based on my reading of biblical texts, I believe that both schools are actually right. They're both right. Let me unpack it a little bit. You see, the Bible reflects this long and juicy tradition of praying ill for one's enemies. They're called imprecatory prayers, where we ask God's judgment to fall quickly and harshly upon those who are guilty, at least in the prayer's perspective, of great injustice. Nehemiah prayed like this over the enemies that taunted him. He said, Hear, O God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and not let their sin be blotted out before you. Ouch. The most famous examples of this are in the Psalms, though. There are more than a dozen of these imprecatory Psalms, and some of them are very imaginative. Break the arm of the evildoers, the psalmist prays in Psalm 10. Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them, says Psalm 35. Dark and slippery. Isn't that fun? Here's a timely one from Psalm 83. As fire consumes the forest... As the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your hurricane. Let burning coals fall on them. Let them be flung into pits, no more to rise, rails the psalmist in Psalm 140. Even our beloved Psalm 139, you know the one, with those tender images of being known before we were born, knit together in our mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made, Includes some verses you won't see on a cross stitch. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. It's important to recognize that the context for most of the imprecatory prayers in scripture is not just a personal vendetta on the part of the writer. It's about sweeping injustice perpetuated against the writer and, and the nation or the community, the people that they feel called to protect. But still, we wonder, how can this kind of language be okay? How is this language in book a book that we just passed out to first graders this weekend? Well, I think what it tells us is that God wants us to be real, for one. There was a theologian who once said, we do not pray as we ought, we pray as we are. We pray as we are, bringing our whole selves, including our grief, our anger, our confusion, even our accusation, as well as our praise. We don't have to worry about parsing it out into, into which feelings are righteous or not, because that's the Holy Spirit's job. And if we're willing to come before God with all of it, without hiding anything, we place ourselves then in the position where God can shape us. And in calling upon God to judge our enemies, 
even though we have in mind exactly what we think they deserve, in essence, we're relinquishing that role of judge back to the one who already holds it, which is God, right? So we're acknowledging God's sovereignty to figure out the best way to deal with our enemies and with us. We're placing both ourselves and our enemies where they rightly belong, in God's hands. And so that leads us to the other side of the paradox, which we hear in Matthew's gospel, where Jesus presents us with prayer for enemies 2.0. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, Jesus says in verse 43. He's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 7. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So how do we get to the place of loving our enemies? Well, it's by God's grace. It's by the work of the Holy Spirit in us through prayer. And that prayer begins right where we are. Some time ago, a pastor I know was praying for some enemies. Lord, I don't know how I'm supposed to love these people, she prayed. But I don't have it in me. I don't understand why they're doing what they do. I feel sick and sad and angry whenever they come to mind. I don't want to love them. I want to crush them. Help me. A few days later, one of these particular enemies came to mind. And interestingly enough, that visceral reflex of hate and rage wasn't there. Well, there was anger there. But to her surprise, a prayer surfaced within her. It wasn't that she wanted to pray it. It wasn't that she thought it up. But it seemed to pray itself within her, almost on its own. And it was a prayer for this enemy's well-being. Ted Loder prays, help me to love the enemies I have the integrity to make. It's one of my favorites. Help me to love the enemies I have the integrity to make. My friends, living in the way of Jesus will inevitably make us some enemies especially the enemies of the poor. There's no virtue in not having enemies, nor is there virtue to be found in condoning or excusing or accepting or ignoring injustice and abuse. But for this pastor, in the days that followed, she found it a little easier to pray for that enemy and also to examine her own complicity in the enemy's wounding behavior. And less blurred by that anger, she became a little bit more clear-eyed about how she might respond to the enemy's attacks. What was hers to control and what wasn't. She still had anger and sadness and disbelief, but those feelings didn't have her. And when the imprecatory prayers did rise up within her, she didn't stifle them. She let them go. And then she let them go. After vowing to hate his enemies with a perfect hatred, the psalmist concludes Psalm 139 by saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When we pray justice rain down on our enemies, our own motives are laid bare in the same divine court. And that too is justice and grace. Amen.